This episode of Baking Day with Anna Olson is brought to you by Libman and Penguin Random House Canada. We'll be hearing more from them later in the episode. I'm Anna Olson, and I'm so pleased you could join me for a baking day. This is a podcast based on my cookbook of the same name, which is all about sharing time in the kitchen, baking with and for family and friends. In each episode, I connect with a special guest and we bake a recipe in our respective kitchens while we chat, visit, share baking stories, and of course, baking tips. The pleasure in baking isn't just the delectable end result, it's the journey of building memories as you spend that time together in the kitchen. And I'm so pleased you could be a part of this. Today, I'm baking with Malaysian culinary personality, Ili Suleiman. Now, Ili and I met in 2016 when I visited Kuala Lumpur to tape an episode of my series, Inspired. And it's ever since then that I have fallen in love with Malaysian cooking, thanks to Ili's help. Now, she was a rising star at the time, but now Ely has gone on to produce a number of culinary shows for the Asian Food Network, and her platform, Dish by Ely, shares those memorable Malaysian recipes, along with a few Western treats. I'm so looking forward to my time in the kitchen with her. Now, Ely is cooking from her own kitchen in Kuala Lumpur, and I am on the other side of the planet, cooking here in Niagara. So let's get started. Well, hello, Ely. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. And it's evening there, right? Yes. Evening, tropical storm happening outside, but it's all good. <laughs> oh my goodness. And it's early morning here. So, but I love that a podcast like this can allow us to bake together at the same time, even though we're 12 hours apart. It's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, it's so wonderful. And thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I'm learning from you now. Like the last time we cooked together, you I was teaching you stuff. So I'm really excited to be here today. Oh, and Ely, let me just say your skills showing me what's at the heart of Malaysian cooking. I learned so much and myself and our whole production team just absolutely adored our time in Kuala Lumpur and I just can't wait to come back and visit. But in the meantime, spending our time in our mutual kitchens, baking together, I think is really something special. So shall we have a baking day? Yes, let's do it. I'm so, so excited. <laughs> I gave you the choice, Ely, to pick mm -hmm. any recipe you wanted from my cookbook to bake and you picked... Potato bread. <laughs> And very specifically, my gluten-free potato bread. I'm so glad because I think this gives our audience a lot of information about all the ingredients, how to make a sliceable sandwich bread that is moist and delicious. And yep. can we just take a minute? Do you have your potato on hand? Uh, yes, your I've, I've really like, um, yeah, I've really cooked it like, as per instructed. Okay, great. <laughs> the recipe calls for one small baking potato. And I treated this recipe almost like banana bread, where it doesn't have to be a specific weight, but you want to make sure you're using a baking style potato. What do you call them? Do you just call it a russet or an Idaho or a um, baking potato? Yeah, we, we only can get russet potatoes here in Malaysia. So um, that's the most, imp that's the only imported kind of um, potato that we get because the local potatoes are a little bit more yellow in color and a little bit more starchier. They're not as fluffy. Ah, okay, interesting. Yeah. Because you want that mealy consistency, I find, for this. So you don't, even though we have no gluten in the bread, we don't want a gluey potato that'll actually mess with the texture of the bread. So you've got the perfect potato, and all yes. we had to do was boil it, and then I yeah. use a ricer. What did you use to, to blend your uh, potato? I'm just gonna use a fork. Because I don't have a ricer. At okay. Home. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah? Because you just you okay. want it a nice even consistency. So yeah. it's not like making mashed potatoes. We're not adding milk or butter or anything to it. We just want yeah. that dry potato texture. We don't eat a lot of potatoes here in Malaysia. We eat a lot of rice, so hence why just a fork will have to do. <laughs> I wonder if you could use cooked rice in place of the potato here. Maybe may, if you use we, like a like a fluffy type of rice, I guess, like, I don't mm -hmm. know, uh, some jasmine rice or basmati rice, something really kind of, yeah, maybe. Yeah, why not? So have you got your potato mashed and ready to go? Uh, no. Shall I do that now? Yeah. Why don't you do that while okay. we keep chatting here? Okay, sure. Okay. I pushed mine through, I have a vegetable ricer. So yeah. while it was warm, I just put the potatoes in here and pressed it right through. I got to get me one of those. 
Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Oh, that broke down very easily. I can see you've kind of got a soft texture there. It's mashed, but it's not clumpy at all, is it? Yeah. And I actually like um, boiled it with a little bit of salt. That's okay, right? Oh yeah, and I did the same too. Okay. We both have about the same volume of potato and I, I would say yes. this is about a, a cup and a half. Like yeah. a med you said like medium sized potato, so I got a... Yeah. They're all about standard size, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but like make making banana bread, you know, a banana bread recipe calls for two bananas. Well, they can vary in size. Yeah, in Malaysia, you can get bananas this size, so... <laughs> Your banana choices are like our apple choices here. We have so many apples, but you have so many bananas. Shall exactly. we get into yeah. mixing the base batter? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay. So we're going to start with the millet flour, 210 yes. grams or 375 mil. This is quite easy to find, to find in Malaysia, actually, because I didn't realize this. I had to call my mother-in-law. We use it in a lot of Indian cooking. Um, it's atta flour in Malaysia. Um, mm -hmm. So it's millet flour. So we use it in our chapatis, in our toses. So this is actually a really easy flour to find in Malaysia. And I was curious too, and in looking up millet flour, of course it's a grass seed, but I learned that it does grow around the world. So this is fantastic. Yeah. It's a high protein option uh, and it grows well in hot climates. Adapting to a gluten-free diet, you need to replace wheat flour with things with structure and substance. And brown yes. rice flour is, is most common here. Uh, yes. What about for your gluten-free baking? I'm extremely lucky to be in Southeast Asia where actually we don't eat a lot of gluten. A lot of gluten comes from, um, you know, maybe the influence of like European uh, cuisine here. Um, so breads and things like that. But a lot of our like local dishes don't have mm -hmm. any gluten in it. So, or wheat. Um, in it so which is awesome actually for me oh it makes it much <laughs> simpler do you have yeah. to watch for gluten in prepared sauces or yes. um other ingredients okay so that's where you pay yeah attention. so like but not i mean i i can't completely uh, like eliminate it completely because if i go out and eat then i'm in a lot of trouble because we like our soy sauce here <laughs> so i do have a little bit of it but like having like, so that's why I'm so happy to be cooking this recipe because I love bread and I miss my sliced bread. So this is like, like a dream come true. So thank you, Anna. I haven't had a sliced bread in almost a year and a half now. Wow. Is that how long you've been going gluten-free? Yeah. Do you <laughs> mind me asking why? Like why now? Yeah, because I got diagnosed with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome mm -hmm. um, about two years ago. So then... Uh, you know, I was talking to a nutritionist friend about it because the doctor says, oh, there's not really a real cure for it. You just got to learn how to manage it uh, through food and lifestyle. So then I was like, OK, well, you know, I'm in the position where I can actually make change because I cook and, you know, I have a platform to share. So then I decided to kind of like investigate and do a little bit of research, talk to some nutritionist friends of mine. And they said, look, I think the easiest way is to just go back to basics of being really Asian and just eliminating dairy and gluten. So we tried that and it, you know, instantly I could feel myself, feel like myself again. <laughs> like I hadn't felt happy and energized in a long time. So I got bundles of energy again. And then uh, obviously cutting off sugar as well because my PCOS um, relates to insulin resistance. So if I have too much sugar, I crash, hence why eating gluten, too much gluten doesn't help as well. So yeah, and then now since I've like completely eliminated all these three things, I mean, I do have a little bit of sugar once in a while, it's fine, um, but I just have to control it. And um, yeah, and I feel, I feel like almost like myself again. So that's quite nice. <laughs> well, you sound like the Ely I know, just bubbly and happy and energetic. So I'm so glad Thanks. you've figured it out <laughs> and you've taken ownership of it and control of it. And the fact that you're sharing it with other people, I think that that's very important too. So thank you for that. No, thanks for, thanks for asking me that question because not a lot of people uh, ask me like, why have you gone gluten-free? They think that oh, it was just like a little bit of a fad because everyone's kind of gone gluten-free and dairy-free and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And it's just like, no, actually there's a reason for it. So it's good to have this kind of conversations, I think. So yeah, so thanks for asking the question. <laughs> you can help explain to other people then how to adapt, which is what we're doing. And of course, typical to a, a baking day, what, what do we do? Mm -hmm. We start chatting and forget about the actual baking. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we've got our millet flour in the bowl. <laughs> 
So you were talking about starches, Ely. Um, yes. And there are, I found for this recipe, they're combining two types of starch, potato yeah. starch and tapioca yes. starch really yes. does um, the trick. So we've got 95 grams of potato starch oh. that I'm just adding yep. to the mixing bowl with my millet flour. And then you've got the same, and then the tapioca starch, which is yep. from your part of the world, from, coming from the cassava roots. Um, yes. I love feeling the starch that it's got that squeaky squidge to it when you kind of yeah. push it between your fingers. I l absolutely love that. We used to um, we used to make glue with this growing up. Oh yeah, yeah, with hot water and tapioca starch, and we used to make paper mache's and play with it as children. <laughs> Well, and it's accessible, it's affordable, it's safe, um, but it, it has a thickening power. Tapioca starch has a thickening power stronger than cornstarch. So that's why you yeah. see it, I find, in a lot of Western style gluten-free baking because it has a bonding power that's stronger than something like cornstarch. And I find potato starch is the same. And I picked the potato starch, to be honest, because it's, yeah. it relates to the potato that's in the recipe itself. Okay. I think it's important. You have both starches, correct? Yes, I, I, I've already added it in. So tapioca and potato starch. When you're buying um, your starches, you want to make sure you're buying the starch and not the flour because the difference is, yes. I don't know how it's labeled in Malaysia, but you can buy tapioca starch and you can buy cassava flour, which is oh. the whole root ground where tapioca is starch is the starch ex extracted. So you want that power of the starch to bind this recipe. I don't think we can get uh, tapioca or cassava flour here. We only have oh. the powder, yeah. So basically they grind it, then they, so uh, they yeah. soak it in water and then they um, kind of sieve it, right? With cheesecloth. That's right, and that's how you pull out the starch and then you get that kind of squeaky, squidgy texture from once it's dried and ground. So satisfying. <laughs> Are you okay adding the two tablespoons of sugar to this yeah. recipe? Yeah, it's like um, my one a day, so it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I just won't eat fruit today, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, and, and you're also not, hopefully, not going to eat the entire loaf of bread. Hopefully you want no, to. No, of course not. But you yeah. won't eat the whole loaf of bread. I might eat it on my own. <laughs> okay, I won't I'm tell. Not sharing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> So all of these dry ingredients we're combining into our mixing bowl. So in goes our rice cooked potato. So you have your yeast. Yes. Now we, our yeast comes in packets. That's two and a quarter teaspoons, but that's the same as seven grams. And this is instant yeah. yeast. So we can just yeah. add it right on top of the flour and the potato. And that's, even though there's no gluten in the bread, that fermentation will give us that real bread flavor and aroma and, and taste and develop a nice crust and it smells so good when it's baking. Uh, oh my let's God, I'm add, so excited. <laughs> do, you, do you have the xanthan gum? Uh, yes. So this is the, probably the hardest, the hardest thing to get, but mm -hmm. I had to go to a specialist store to get this and it was really, really pricey. So I was just wondering if there's a, an alternative to xanthan gum that we could possibly get? I think that's a very good question, Ely. I think if you yeah. can't find xanthan, um, you can use guar gum in its place. And its impact is less about when the bread is baking, it's when we're mixing it to make the ingredients feel combined. And, and yeah, it, it's, it, it's expensive to buy here too, but you use such small amounts um, that yeah, a little true. goes a long way and it keeps forever. So guar gum okay. is an appropriate substitute and you would probably okay. need a little more of it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so back to it. We've got, um, I add a little bit of baking powder You've got a little yep, bit, of, got you've that. got that ready, in that goes. Yep. And that helps just amplify the volume we want to coax out of this recipe. And of course, salt for seasoning. I'm using um, pink Himalayan pink salt, is that okay? Ooh, oh, you got the fancy salt. I'm using sea salt, but just regular sea salt. And okay. now that we have the dry goods, we can add our liquids, which oh, cool. again are simple, but they each have their function. The water is the most obvious. So yes. 175 ml or three quarters of a cup goes right in. And you want it to be room temperature. Or, oh, I like that picture of yours. That's very pretty. Yeah. I buy random stuff from wherever, so I, I don't actually remember where I got it from, <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> in addition to the water, we want to add a little fat just for to, to create that sort of sandwich bread 
texture. You could use a plain vegetable oil, but I do like yeah. adding olive oil. So 60 mils goes into okay. the mixing bowl. You don't want to use too strong of an oil. Are, are you using yeah. olive oil? Olive oil. But yeah. just the, not extra virgin, just the normal. Yeah, yeah it doesn't have to be the fancy, you know, your expensive yeah. drizzle on ripe tomatoes kind of olive oil. We're going to add our three eggs. Okay. You def definitely need the eggs for the structure and the volume. Um, in gluten-free baking, I have found um, for Western style baking that I rely on the protein in the eggs to help set things. Um, oh, right. Okay. Which when you're taking out the, the protein of the flour, you have to replace the protein with something else. So yes. you're, you're good of with course. eggs though, right? You just steer clear of dairy. Yeah. Eggs yeah. is like my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have eggs and rice and a bit of sambal every day and I'll be fine. Oh my gosh. I remember when we made sambal balachan sambal. together. <gasps> yes. Oh, that so was good. my first exposure to that brick of shrimp paste. And I'm sure that uh, my producer, Jennifer, who's <laughs> with us here today, remembers the expression on my face when I smelled that shrimp paste for the first time. Taken aback, but definitely bought in, <laughs> which is important. But with the chili peppers, oh, that sambal you made was so, so delicious. Okay, back to the bread. <laughs> and then the very last thing to add is that bit of vinegar, which is actually a very important ingredient because that helps actually develop a nice chewiness to this bread that makes it taste and feel like a wheat flour based bread. I use rice, uh, rice vinegar because that's the only thing I have. It's an Asian kitchen, sorry. <laughs> okay. I like that we're, we're giving this recipe a Malaysian flair. I think it's fantastic. Slightly. <laughs> so then we mix this up. Yeah, now we're, you're going to use electric beaters. I ended up pulling out my yeah. mixer. You can okay. do it by hand, but I find you, you want to really develop um, put some volume in it. It's mostly about developing volume with the eggs. So first I beat it on low speed and then I okay. increase the speed. But unlike bread, where you have yeah. to knead it and knead it for about five minutes in the mixer, 10 minutes by hand, well, there's no need to knead it here, right? So yep. why don't we mix our uh, batter for one minute and we'll use okay. that as an opportunity to let our sponsors say a little word. So we'll see you in a moment. Embrace the mess with Libman. Time spent in the kitchen doesn't have to be hindered by spilled sugar or messy sauces, flying cake batter or cookie crumbs, or even a sink full of dirty dishes. Go ahead, embrace the mess. From countertops, cutting boards, and cookware, to backsplashes, cabinet doors, floors, and quite literally the kitchen sink, Libman's collection of premium quality brushes, sponges, mops, and brooms designed with ergonomic features and environmentally friendly materials help you conquer kitchen cleanup easily and waste-free. So break out the bakeware and have some fun in the kitchen. Embrace the mess and live in the moment with Libman. Available at the Home Depot and Canadian Tire. And you can learn more on Facebook at Libman Canada and on Instagram at Libman CA. All right, Ely, is your bread dough mixed? I think so. Is it supposed to look like that? <laughs> yep, gloppy. And well, it's more of a batter, isn't it? And yeah. I, I think if I can touch on the number of times I made this recipe before <laughs> I finally got it right, I was struggling so much, Ely, because I was stuck in the world of wheat-based breads where you make a dough yeah. and it has to be dense enough that you can knead it and yes. you need to be able to knead it. Yes. And I couldn't get my head wrapped around the fact that my, my, what would happen is every time I made a bread dough, um, it would bake up like a brick. It would be so dense and heavy. And Ely, I could have built a shed <laughs> out of the number of bricks of gluten-free, not delicious bread I made. And I realized I had to change my mindset, add more liquid and treat this like a cake batter. And this is how, while well, it's kind of gluey. Yeah, it is. Um, it's and really how, sticky. how is the texture of yours? Does it feel kind of gluey yeah. and stretchy? Yes. And like, like I, I guess like a really thick, like cake batter. That's exactly what it feels like. And I realized if I treat it like a cake batter, it behaves better and it bakes up how it, almost like a cake, of course, without the sugar. So it's got the eggs in there. Yeah. And I think the stretchiness comes from the starch we've added and it comes from that xanthan gum. Um, right. Or as we've determined, if we used guar, you get this 
like, like it can be really, <laughs> it's really stretchy, but, but it's, but you can spread it. It's, it's not, you would not handle this with floured hands and try and knead it. It is like a thick batter, isn't it? Yeah. So you don't need to like, you know, over beat it or like try and roll it out at this point. You just leave it as it is. Treat it like, yeah. like a cake better. Okay. That's exactly it. You can't overwork it because the, pro you know, the, we get stuck when it comes to making wheat flour based recipes that you yeah. don't want to overwork or over knead a recipe yeah. because it will toughen it. Well, mm. we don't have that problem here because there's no wheat flour. So of course. you just have to make sure everything is combined, okay. really well combined. I really love this recipe because it's like everything in one bowl. The only thing you need to do <laughs> is measure everything out. But, you know, you there's no real like science. I mean, there is science to it in terms of the measurements, but it's everything goes into the bowl. It's like making brownie, but you're making bread <laughs> that's gluten free. It's like awesome. <laughs> that's exactly like and th the magic is all in that combination of ingredients. Yeah. To, to bring it together. It's really less to do with what we're we're up to here. We I, I really think you could mix this batter by hand. Yeah. It would just take an extra minute, but just it's simply until everything's combined. Now, do you have your loaf pan greased yes. and did you grease it, line it with parchment or yeah. just grease it? Um it's uh, it's got a little bit of um vegetable oil and then I um cut up parchment just in case because parchment? Yes. Okay. I'm going to just walk away for a second because I have it in the other room. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> this is what happens when you do podcasts yeah. at home. <laughs> and I'm back with a pan. So I've got a standard loaf pan and I just put parchment on the long sides and along the bottom. That way I yeah. can lift it out easily. But I did grease it first. Uh, so ours is a little bit different. I think it's a four by six. Eight, That's four by fine. eight. Yeah. yeah, it all it all comes out. The only thing that might change is the bake time may vary depending yes. on the volume, how how tight the batter is. Okay, done. So just like a cake batter, we'll scrape the batter from our mixing bowl into okay. the loaf pan, and then you can take the time to spread it. I um, I used an offset spatula just to smooth the top surface of the um, the dough. Okay. Um, but I like the crunchy bits on the top of the bread. So can I just leave it like spiky? Y you totally can. That was the first thing that surprised me with this particular recipe when I started playing with the potato okay. is I got a crust because that can be a, a real struggle when you're making gluten-free bread. Oh, really? Is getting that crust. Yeah. Okay. Because everything comes out kind of soft. Right. I just assumed that, you know, because I like crusty bread, that this will be a crusty potato bread. <laughs> I don't know why. I thought that it will be like, I mean, I'm sure it's nice and soft and fluffy, but. Yeah, on the inside and it's nice and moist. And yeah. there's also, I found, I don't know how much Western style gluten-free baking you're do you've done, but you know, if you make something like a banana bread yeah. or a fruit loaf or something, it kind of goes squidgy after a day yeah like it's really best the day it's baked yes and then if you're not going to eat it right away you have to freeze it yes true but i i have found that this recipe um stays fresh for about three days and it toasts you can make great toast with it too Ooh, i can't wait oh all right so i've just taken a small offset spatula to my bread but you want to leave sort of the peaks on top of your bread yeah. from extra crust but i'm smoothing yeah. mine out a little bit but that's really up to you. And really the, the batter comes three quarters the way up the pan, just like a regular wheat bread, you have to leave room for this to rise up a little bit. But you'll notice, unlike when you make a typical bread, you have to take it out of the mixing bowl, you have to let it rise for an hour, then you shape it, then you let it rise again, and then you get to baking it, where with this loaf, you just put it right in the pan and you let it sit uncovered for about 45 minutes until you see it come up. And that it will hold in the air. You want that fermentation for the flavor. And I really love the smell and uh, it really does smell like bread. So it's not like you're, you know, you're not faking it with me right now. It smells so good. It just, just like bread. Yeah. yeah. It's got a, a toastiness, like a, yeah. a nuttiness to a it, nuttiness. It? But it smells like you're making something that's going to be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I talked about how many versions of this recipe I made before yes. I got to settling on this, this ratio and these combination of ingredients. Yeah. How, how do you develop recipes? Because you've got such a diverse mix um, in your, 
Like on your website, you offer everything from classic Malaysian dishes, but you also modernize them. You've got um, Asian baking, Western baking. How do you come up with recipes? I think my biggest influence is the people I meet. So they kind of inspire me to make something of their favorite something, you know? So I always have conversations with friends and they're like, oh my God, Eli, I remember when I was growing up, we used to eat this, you know, fried noodles with like, you know, um, some fried, deep fried, fried chicken. And you could only get it in the cafeteria at our school. And I'll be like, hmm, I can make that. So it's something that kind of like having conversations with people, getting excited about their stories. And then like, I go back in the kitchen, remake it or try and make a version of it and then like get them to come over and try it. And if they really like it and they're like, oh my God, you should put this up, then like, it goes up. So a lot of my recipes comes, um, you know, it comes from the people that I mix around with. It's not necessarily like the ingredients that kind of inspire me. It's more people and the stories and having eating or eating at friends', friends house or relatives house or you know, just experiences really more than anything. Now, do you have honest friends? So if they don't like something or they didn't, if you didn't do it right, will they tell you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Malaysians are super critical when it comes to food because, you know, we've got such a diverse uh, palate when it comes to uh, Asian cuisine because, you know, as you know, you've been here before, you've eaten the food. We've got influences from Chinese, from Canton regions, from the Fuchao region. We've got... Um, food from, you know, uh, the Indian cuisine here from like North India to South India. And then we've mm. of course got Malay food, which has a lot of influence from Indonesia and Brunei and Singapore. And, you know, everything's kind of like, it's like a collective of food. So Malaysians are very, very particular about what they like. And um, every time, you know, we cook a meal, like, of course, I'm not going to be able to please everyone, but at least people are happy that they get a free meal. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I win. <laughs> I will vouch for that cultural diversity and yeah. just the the variety of dishes and flavors that you can get when you visit Malaysia. And I just, I pine for it sometimes. Aww. And the dessert culture is its own category. Yes. Just the, the sweets in Malaysia, all the, the little kueh. Um, the quay lapis, um, the, the stuffed and filled things like onde onde, onde I yeah. just, I adore them. And it's like, it's, it's, it, I guess it's things that you never really thought could come together. Like who would have thought you could make an array of dessert with just the coconut, you know? And we literally use the coconut for every single dessert. Like it's really straight. It's almost like not possible to make a really delicious dessert without using coconut in Malaysia. So... I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, well, with a singular ingredient to make so many desserts with such a variety of textures and flavors. And yeah, it is. And not overly sweet all the time, which is really something I enjoy about Malaysian desserts. Yeah. Because they're, they're more about the flavor of the ingredients, not we just the sweetness. Yeah, we can't wait to, you know, get you to come back and eat some more and travel and there's so many other things that you have to try. You have to come back soon. Well, I know. <laughs> I accept that invitation. <laughs> back to our bread. Here we go. We're off topic again. We've got one bread in the pan. This we would let sit uncovered. There's no need to cover it yeah. um, for about 45 minutes. You have one you made before we yeah. came together to start baking together, right? Yeah. All right, let's pull that. I'm going to pull mine side by side so we can compare the difference. After about 45 minutes, you can really see the difference of how the loaf, it does hold in the air that the yeast produced um, and it has come up over the loaf pan uh, and it has a nice dome to it just the way a regular wheat-based loaf of bread has to it. Yours is and really perfect yours. and mine's all because I like mine crusty. But you like the crusty bit. So you've kind of got craggy edges to the yeah. top of your loaf. But, oh, I can see how that's going to make a beautiful crust um, to kind of crackle into as you slice. <laughs> that's okay, right? Not oh, it's be... perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're making it Ely style. Yeah. And that's what a baking day is all about. We, you know, our hands go into our recipes and yeah. make them what a reflection of who we are. So that's totally your bread. It's a hot mess. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes 
the hot messes come out to be the best tasting things. You know, part of the recipe process is making those mistakes. And I've had some of the best recipes happen by accident. Um, either I'll forget. I remember making a uh, chocolate caramel fudge. I had no intention of making it a caramel fudge, but I left it cooking too long too on long. the stove. So it caramelized and it turned out to be just the best thing. Really? Um, so yeah, sometimes it's an accident. You've got your oven preheated? Uh, no. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. You've got a little oven. It'll take no time. But yeah. it does the trick. It's a tabletop oven. Uh, yeah. I see you have there. So it'll take no time to heat up. But this fits in your tabletop oven just fine, which is a good note because you don't have to have, I have a bit of a beast of an oven. You can see behind me here. It is a commercial deck oven that I have in my kitchen. It's an antique, um, but it works great. But uh, I can really put a lot of things in there, but it doesn't matter the size of the oven. It's it's the temperature that counts. So yeah. you've, you're preheating yours to 180 Celsius. That's yep. 350 Fahrenheit. And you give me a shout when that's just oh, about it's ready really to go. Quick. Does it only take a... Okay. Yeah, it's really like... I I've, I've just like yank it up a little bit. And then it will kind of cool down when it goes back to 180. Yeah. I find one of the best tools you can have in the kitchen is actually an oven thermometer. The thermometer that lives inside the oven. Because even though you set your oven to a temperature, it doesn't always stay there. So I always put a thermometer inside my oven just to double check. So I think I need to make a list of things I have to get. <laughs> 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 because I don't, to be honest, Anna, I'm so excited that you've like, you know, kind of pushed me to go on this. And then I remember when we were discussing about the recipe and then I was saying that I really want to do potato bread because, you know, we used to eat potato bread at home. And I'm so happy you allowed me to do this because I really don't know how to bake very well because, as you know, Asian desserts are very simple. We don't use the oven very often. It's all a lot of steaming True. and things like that. So I'm very uncomfortable when it comes to, like, real, real baking. So I was like, you know what? I am going to challenge myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get this right. So I'm like, so I'm really pleased that it actually turned out. My love of baking is kind of like your inspiration for your creating recipes is that act of sharing. And it's not just sharing the end result of the baked good and eating it. It's the sharing of the information and the time spent and building the memory. So this is just so great. I have, I have so many visions of my time in Malaysia running through my head right now, just being able to talk to you about um, the, the country and the cooking. And well, it is, it always comes down to the food, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. And I bet it's in that hot. time, your oven is preheated. Ready to go? Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to go. Okay, so we'll pop our, our respective loaves of gluten-free potato bread in the oven and we'll use this baking time as a quick break uh, to say hello to our sponsors. Do you love wowing your family and friends with beautiful show-stopping desserts? And is your mouth watering at the idea of candy cane cupcakes or salted caramel macaron? Or how about peanut butter and jam cookie sandwiches? Then I have the cookbook for you. Jenna Ray Cakes and Sweet Treats from the beloved family-owned Canadian bakery is perfect for holiday gifting for someone special or maybe for yourself. Penguin Random House Canada is giving you a chance to win a copy of Jenna Ray Cakes and Sweet Treats and some of this season's hottest cookbooks. Go to penguinrandomhouse.ca slash cook and enter by December 7th. That's penguinrandomhouse.ca slash cook and some restrictions may apply. Well, here we are back just finishing up our gluten-free potato bread and Ely, how did yours come out? Beautiful! So did you find that in your tabletop oven, the loaf took 40 minutes, just like in my regular oven? Uh, yes, uh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so the same time. Yeah, about the same time. But the, the top, obviously, because I was it's all bumpy, it was a little bit crusty in the top. So I just had to poke it to make sure that it was cooked in the middle. And then you test the doneness. Interestingly, we were talking about how this is like a cake batter. You test the doneness like you do a cake. You insert a skewer in the center of the loaf, when it comes out clean, then you know it's fully cooked. So that too was something different to get my head around in converting from baking a loaf of bread with wheat flour to a gluten-free one. The rest is you just, you pull it out of the pan after a few minutes, you let it cool on the rack. Cause if you let it cool in the pan, it'll steam. 
um, and then you won't get that nice crusty outside to the bread. So I want I want to see what your gluten free potato bread came out with. I'm gonna go get I'm mine too. I'm gonna get mine Ready? as well. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> oh wow! <gasps> Look at yours. Oh, it's beautiful. It's nicely got little balls done. The top. <laughs> Oh, I can tell you just love that. Yeah, I <laughs> Having love it. Having those little, little bumps. Yeah, and it's crusty. Yeah, you it looks that? just like a regular loaf of bread, doesn't yeah. it? It's got a nice even brown to it, even on the sides and the bottom. Um, the reason you want to take it out of, the ov um, out of the pan soon out of the oven is because it will sweat or develop condensation on the sides and you lose that crust. Right, okay. But let's, I'm going to grab a knife. Let's slice into But mine our... kind of like collapsed a little bit. Is that okay? Is that normal? I think it is. I think that's part of just accepting what we're what we're doing. Just like comparing a cake to a loaf of, of regular wheat bread, a cake sometimes collapses a little bit, like yeah. a sponge cake. So this is that same idea. I think it's the eggs uh, oh. contracting a little bit, okay. but it doesn't make the bread heavy at all. And let's slice. Cool. Interesting. Oh. It kind of feels like a dense cake, but not quite. Oh, look at that. It's even look. <laughs> I made gluten free bread, guys. Ely, you get to eat bread. <laughs> I know. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. It looks just like a, a slice, like a sandwich loaf. It's yeah. got the big airy holes, but also sm uh, small holes. It's got. There's a hole in it. I can actually look through the hole. No, oh. <laughs> which that's the hardest part with baking gluten free is getting that volume, the, the air in there. This oh, it smells amazing. good. It smells really good. Can mm. I eat it? Yeah, you can eat it. I've got some butter and jam here. I don't know what you want to put on yours. I'm just, I'm just going to go Are you just going to eat it. a plain? Oh my God, I know. Oh, it's really moist too. And it tastes like bread. And it tastes like bread. Oh, Ely, you've made me happy. This is why we have a baking day, so we can... It's so mm. good. Mm -hmm. And it holds together when you bite it. It doesn't just crumble or yeah. fall apart. You can make a sandwich with this, right? Yeah. You can make so mm. many things. It does freeze well. If you have space in your freezer, if you don't want to eat the whole loaf all at once, you can freeze it. But I find it keeps for about three days on the counter okay. in good shape. Like, it stays nice and moist. Oh, your face. I can tell you're so happy. <laughs> I really didn't think that like the millet flour was something so accessible that I could use to get the same flavor. You know what I mean? Because like, mm -hmm. I think that what's, that's what makes it taste different. It's not, it's the, it's the millet flour. So I think I'm going to be using a lot more millet flour in other things. Well, and actually... Us having this conversation is inspiring me to play with millet flour more. I, yeah. I've typically reserved it more for savory baking, like a loaf of bread or something that involves herbs or cheese. Yeah. But I think I may try more in desserts. And I think it's the the nuttiness that yeah. millet flour has that I, to me reminds me of the wheat flour. And I think we've got the moisture from the potato in there. Yeah. And there's, again, I can't say this tastes like potato, but it's got a moisture and, and a familiarity. A, a, there's something comforting about it. Yeah. That, um, and I think the potato helps too. Yeah, we have potato bread in Malaysia, but this is like a hundred mm -hmm. times better. <laughs> Just saying, and I'm a fan of potato bread. <laughs> It's so good. And the crust is pretty good. Yeah. I mean, something to point out is with, with this style of bread, you won't get a crust like a French baguette that crackles and comes off in shards. No. Because the ingredients just aren't there to do it. But you do get a definite crust with a definite crunch and a toastiness to it that is different than the interior of the bread. I'm not complaining. I've caught you with your mouth full. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You've just brought like a whole load of joy to me. So thank you so much. You know, I was thinking like, oh, potato bread is going to taste something like what I grew up eating in Malaysia, which is like the really sweet uh, kind of potato bread, really fluffy. But I kind of almost like this better because it's like the adult version of like a gluten free potato bread, like something a little bit more sophisticated a little bit more, you know, dietary requirement wise, it hits all the spots and it tastes amazing. And, you know, it's kind of good to have 
an option um, to, I mean, for me, this is like the perfect satisfying thing to learn. And I, I hope to continue making this forever and ever. I never. <laughs> it's so good. Well, Eli, I hope you do keep making it and expanding your gluten-free baking repertoire. And of course, I welcome you to reach out anytime as you're developing recipes if you have some questions. Everybody heard that. It's a learning curve for most people. You know, this is a new thing to understand how um, baking without wheat flour for uh, health reasons is is a choice, but it's new to us. So we're all on the same adventure together. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why we're having this baking day. So we could share, visit. You've got me a little homesick for visiting Malaysia. So as soon as I can get on a plane and come see you, I am going to take you up on that. Please and I come. do want to come have dinner at your mother-in-law's. Yes, <laughs> please bring everybody. Oh. Everybody's welcome, okay? In Malaysia, my house is your house. So. Yes. <laughs> and my producer, Jennifer, is waving from behind the camera like, me too, me too, me too. Come, Jennifer, go. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we have TJ on board too. He yes, would come. Yes, of yeah. course. Everyone's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ely, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm so glad we could have this baking day together because here we are baking and sharing. And that's what it's all about. Thank you, Anna. Sending you lots of love from tropical Malaysia. And thanks for teaching me <laughs> lots of tricks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. And thank you for being a part of our baking day. I hope you've picked up some good baking tips and had a few laughs along the way. You can pick up your own copy of Baking Day at your favorite bookseller, or you can get it in ebook form online so that you can have your very own baking day. See you soon.